Uh, I've known uh, Dana Fisher since uh, graduate school days at University of Wisconsin, so I'm very pleased to be able to introduce her uh, for this uh, IBIS series, sem seminar series. Uh, Dana Fisher is Professor of Sociology and Director of the Program for Society and Environment at the University of Maryland. Her research focuses on understanding the relationship between environmentalism and democracy, most recently studying activism in American climate politics. She employs a mixed methods approach that integrates data collected through semi-structured interviews and participant observation with their various forms of survey data. Professor Fisher is author or co-author of four books, two edited volumes, and numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals, including very recent publications in Local Environment, Science Advances, and Nature Climate Change. This work has been supported by numerous grants, including grants from the National Science Foundation, the Norwegian Research Council, and the MacArthur Foundation. And it is circulated widely in online and print media, podcasts, documentary film, and television broadcasts. Most recently, Dana was featured on a segment of MSNBC's Morning Joe news program. Currently, she's writing American Resistance, book that will be published by Columbia University Press after the 2018 midterm elections. Today, she'll share some of the findings from this research in a talk titled Climate of Resistance, How the Climate Movement Con Connects to the Resistance. Marina, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So there are seats here if people standing want to sit but or just stand. Um, okay. So today I'm actually going to talk about work that merges previous work I've been doing on the climate movement. I started studying the climate movement in 2000 with this broader movement, uh, this broader research that I've been doing on the resistance. And I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go along. Um, there's a paper from this which is actually coming out in a an issue, or not an issue, a volume at Oxford University Press that Sid Tarot and David Meyer are editing. Um, that's on the resistance and actually has already gone to press. So if anybody's interested, I'm happy to share a PDF. I thought I would just start by contextualizing my comments within kind of my research agenda. So I, uh, I am a pie-shaped researcher, which means I do lots of different things that I like to think of as being related within the pie. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the work on activism and protests. And so I have this work that's been ongoing on the climate movement, but I also have this new book project on American resistance. So my other work looks at social theory um, that specifically looks at the society environment in a relationship. And I have a paper that hopefully will be coming out sometime soon on that. And then I also have this long-term project on climate politics and policy networks in the United States, looking at both the federal level as well as in swing states in the United States which has been particularly depressing recently. But um, it goes on, and that will be producing stuff as well. In a lot of ways, though, although I am a pie type of researcher where I have different projects, there's a lot of in relations and overlaps, particularly with the way that I think about power, uh, the role of different social actors, particularly civil society actors, social movements within decision making. And so hopefully you'll agree that that all makes sense by the time I'm done today. I thought I would start, just because I wasn't sure who was going to be in the crowd, with uh, a little something in the climate movement. OK, so the, the image in the middle is actually currently still on NASA's page. If you were to Google NASA and climate change, this is what you'll get. This is the image they have on climate change, which obviously shows climate variability here. And as the climate is changing, people have mobilized around it within a movement. So I have been studying the climate movement, as I said, since 2000. I started it at um, doing this research at the climate negotiations in The Hague at COP6. And since then, I have collected data on a whole bunch of different movements, but I continue again and again to return to the climate movement. These are four pictures of different groups that were in the crowd at the People's Climate March in 2014 in New York City. Anybody go to the People's Climate March? Looky there. All right. So maybe you see yourself. Um, OK. So today, what I'm going to do is ask this question. Um, how has the climate movement connected with the resistance? So the resistance, just so we're all on the same page, uh, I'm using the term that the movement itself uses to describe itself. But just so you know how I'm bracketing it, I have decided to frame it very large, very wide. So I have the definition that I use is 
people and organizations that are working to challenge the Trump agenda, the Trump administration and its policies, basically. So to the degree, and I've been asked by a ridiculous number of reporters about the role that the Antifa plays in the resistance, because everybody was really excited about how you know people on the left were getting violent. Um, and my answer to that is that to the degree that they are challenging the Trump administration and its policies, they are part of the resistance. To the degree that they are going to smash the heads of Nazis, not the resistance. So just to give you a sense of how I bracket it. So the question that I was tasked with for this volume was, how is the climate movement joining the resistance? So the first thing that I'm going to do is, it happens to be since I've been collecting data uh, at climate protests since 2000, is I happen to have data from the People's Climate March. Here is where they were walking down right by Radio City. You see beautiful, peaceful protest. Um, so I have data from 2014. And then there was a People's Climate March that was scheduled prior to the Trump administration taking office to take place in Washington, DC um, in 2017. So basically to compare those two data sets. And I'll tell you how I collect the data in a second. But then what I wanted to do is compare that to recent activism more broadly within the resistance, and then discuss what that means. So that's what I'm going to do today. OK, so just as to, for those of you who don't study social movements or spend a lot of time thinking about civil society and how it works, these are some of the big perspectives within the literature that I'm engaging with. Um, one is the social networks approach that says that people who mobilize and get involved in activism are mobilized through people they know, personal ties, and organizations that are, they're affiliated with, so organizations that they're members of or they support. At the same time, there has been this growing research that looks at protest experience and specifically more, you know, this recent stuff has actually talked about what is the difference between first timers and what we call diehards, you know, the people who are like, whatever we're protesting, I'm in, you know, those people. But there are differences there. And the research has actually found that the, the diehards tend to be really organizationally embedded, which makes a lot of sense. They belong, they're joiners, right? So they join organizations. And when organizations say march, they march. But then there's also this research on intersectionality. And intersectionality, is, most of it is not tended to focus on activism per se, but rather on how overlapping racial, class, gender, and sexual identities play a role in society broadly. But there has been this growing research recently that specifically looks at overlapping motivations and how coalitions form across these overlapping identities. So my colleagues, Rayshawn Ray, Dawn Dow, and I published a paper in Science Advances this year. No, I guess it's last year now, in 2017, that was specifically looking at intersectionality across participants in the Women's March. And what we specifically did there was look at these overlapping motivations. And I'm going to extend that research in some ways today. So we'll, I'll tell you when we get there. But basically, the idea was to bring these different ways that we can think about mobilization and participation and activism and protest to bear on the climate movement with the hope that then we learn something about the climate movement, which I think we do. Let's see if you guys agree. So ooh, data collected. OK, so as I said, I've been going out and collecting data on pro climate protests and the climate movement since 2000. And basically, um, <laughs> basically, that's the next slide that I'm going to talk about. So first, let me tell you which protests I went to. And basically, we collected data at the People's Climate March in 2014 in New York City at the Women's March in 2017, on the day after the inauguration, and the People's Climate March in Washington, DC. This is a picture from the People's Climate March in Washington, DC in April of this past year. This gives you a sense of the turnout. Did anybody go to the People's Climate March in Washington, DC? We had one here. Yeah. OK. Well, wait, so we had one in DC. Did anybody go to the People's Climate March in Rhode Island? All right, so probably the same number as we're there. OK. Anyway, so. Now I'll tell you about the data. So those are the data I collected. This is how we do it. So we use what's called a field approximation of random sampling. This is where if anybody watched the Morning Joe segment, you saw Mika's eyes roll backwards and her start to sound really, like, look really bored and annoyed that I was talking about sampling on national television, <laughs> where we've actually basically go through a crowd and sample every fifth person. And the idea is to snake through the crowd so you're not approaching what we call these approachable peers, the people who make eye contact, who look really excited about taking a survey, and you get every fifth person. <laughs> and um, I think it's really funny because we, we have done this, and um, I have sampled national reporters. And I had one of my students who sampled Richard Branson in Washington, DC. 
But I just want everybody to know here that nobody on my research team, I usually take a big research team, nobody has ever seen Leonardo DiCaprio <laughs> there. Which is particularly surprising because we have people throughout the crowd. And I, I, got a, I got the secret down low on how it is that, that Leo goes, but he never waits. So, and it involves a biofuel car. So, anyway. So we collected data. This has been happening since 2000. Originally collected data using the old clipboard paper method. And in 2017, because there was a lot of interest in getting the data entered quickly and because data entry is really unpleasant for anybody who's ever done it, we, tra we transitioned to collecting data on little tablets out in the field, which works relatively well. Although Scott was with me at the March for Science, where we learned that Tablets don't work so well when it's pouring rain, especially when you have older respondents holding the tablet up to the rain so that all the water pours right into where the electrical like charge goes to see if they can kill the data on the tablet. But we did say we got all the data off the tablets except for 12, which was pretty good. And we did also learn that if you stick tablets in bags of rice, it actually does work. So learned a lot out of that. But so now we collect data with tablets, but we use the same survey instrument. And it includes questions about mobilization, civic engagement participation, demographics. And starting in 2017, I added two things that weren't on the survey instrument before. I added a race question. Why I didn't have a race question before, I don't really know, except for that um, a lot of the data were being collected internationally. And it's very hard to get people to, to check off census categories if you're collecting data abroad. And because I was ignorant and naive. Um, so we, we added race. And the other thing we added is we added a motivation question. So historically, people who study social movements do not come up to somebody at a people, People's Climate March and say, why are you here? The assumption is you're here because you care about climate change, right? So here's the answer that I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you before I show my slides is that that's not always the case. So we actually did that because at the Women's March, we knew that people were coming out for a whole suite of reasons. And we found some really interesting patterns there. So I decided, you know what, we're going to keep this on the survey instrument and start to track how these patterns are changing and morphing over time. So, and there'll be more on that soon. So here are some data. All right, so these are just comparing demographics for the People's Climate March 2014 versus 2017, so we get a sense. And basically, what I can tell you here is that um, the data are, that arrow, it's kind of annoying right there. OK. Um, so the, the data are pretty, pretty consistent, right? We have, uh, in general, participants are highly educated, more female than male, and politically liberal, um, which is not really surprising, because if you look at data on volunteerism in general in the United States or the environmental movement in the United States, this is a completely consistent. It tends to be more women than men highly educated. Um, the average age at both events was 42 years old. So I'd like to think that is not particularly old, but not particularly young either. Um, the one thing I would say, that the, the one little asterisk on that is that because we collect data consistent with IRB protocol rules, we cannot collect data on anybody under 18. So if we could collect data from the five-year-olds in the crowd, it could balance that out a little bit. OK. So when we start thinking about how people are coming out, and this is getting at these questions about social ties and the, the role that social networks are playing in mobilizing people, again, the data are pretty consistent. In case you're wondering why they don't add up to 100, it's check all that apply. Not that I don't know how to do math. Um, so what you really see here that I think is most interesting is that most respondents come through social networks as the literature leads us to predict. Um, but as you'll see, personal networks, that is friends, family member, colleagues, co-students, become much more important in the more recent PCM. And so when it's and the organizational ties here, I just want to say it says colleagues and co-students here, but this is like student groups. Like I'm sure that Brown has many environmental groups on campus, right? Yeah. yeah. Figured. Okay, so like that. So what we see is consistency across organizational role here, but the personal ties. There's a chair there if you want to sit in chair. OK. Um, organizational ties stay consistent. Personal networks have become increasingly important. And I actually think that in some ways, that plays into the narrative of the resistance and the way that the resistance is pulling people out over and over and over and over again. And that you really need people whom you know to call you up or you know send you an, another, a Facebook message saying, come on, I know it's raining. 
March for Science is important. Um, okay, so then the other way that we think about social ties is how the information is getting diffused. And this is a these are this is a table of how people heard about People's Climate March. Okay, so they they checked all that applied, and again here you'll see consistency across families, friends, as well as so the social ties in terms of the personal ties versus the organizational ties. Very consistent. Here are the most interesting differences here. Um, first of all, flyers or posters. Look how crazy this is over. I'm going this way because I want to trip on that thing right there. Right here. Like, look at how much higher that is than in 2017. And here is the answer. So I was like, what's going on here? And it happens to be when we were in New York City for 2014, uh, we rode the subway, as people are wont to do. And on every subway car, there was a poster for the People's Climate March. All of these down here are examples of posters. So there was a poster competition that they ran for the artist community in New York City, and they said, submit your poster, and the top, I forget how many, it wasn't just these four, will actually be posted, and we will hang them on every subway and every, like I forget, it was bus stop in New York City. And they did, actually. So the deal is that the word got out through these posters. And in contrast, in Washington, D.C. in 2017, they know stapled to a couple of telephone poles. Not a lot of people heard about it that way. However, in 2017, as you might expect, you've got you know really high role for social media. And it's interesting to think about this, because social media has diffused. People use it more and more. I finally joined Facebook, which has to say something about <laughs> how it's diffusing. Um, but mostly, it suggests that, like, Social media is becoming increasingly important to activism. And I actually I was talking with a colleague, Jennifer Earle, who's probably one of the, the, the sociologists who does the most using technology and social movements. And she and I are trying to figure out how to think about social media and ask better questions about this. Because they're just, it, it's insufficient just to be able to check this off. Because as we all know, social media are posted through organizations, they're posted through friends, et cetera, and so forth. And we have to pull that apart. But what I can tell you here is that social media becomes really, really important. And actually, this is not particularly surprising, again, within the story of the resistance, where the resistance began with the Women's March. And the Women's March began with a Facebook post by a grandmother in Hawaii on the morning after the election who was like, ah, Donald Trump is president, we must march. And it went crazy. I mean, and some of it's urban lore, but most of it is not. She posted this thing on Facebook. People reposted it. It went crazy. And all of a sudden, there were organizers who had history within the women's movement who got involved and coordinated the Women's March. So social media has been key within the resistance. Facebook played a role in the Women's March. Reddit played a role, which I've never been on Reddit, but I sat next to somebody on the airplane here who was on Reddit. Um, Reddit played a huge role in the March for Science, of all things. Um, the People's Climate March, in contrast, actually the organizers of the People's Climate March 2014 were actually organizing the People's Climate March 2017. So in some ways, the People's Climate March is slightly different from a lot of these other protests that have happened since the inauguration. But in some ways, they're not different. So then we talk about the experience of the participants. OK, so again, it's pretty similar here, right? So 2014, 38% of the people say it's the first time that they've ever participated in a protest, or their first time in five years. So they are um, disengaged sympathizers is the term. In 2017, it's 32%. But here's the thing that I think is very interesting. And we added this to the survey in 2017, is every time I collect data out of March, I then add data, I add the list of any of the previous marches where we collected data to ask people to ch check off if they went to those marches. And as a result, I can tell you that 70% of the people who were at the People's Climate March had participated in the Women's March. Not necessarily in Washington, D.C., but they had marched in the Women's March. 34% of them had participated in the March for Science. So we're seeing a lot of repeat participation. And one of the things that's fascinating is somebody who studies social movements and protests is that you do not assume that the people who are going to march and take a day off to go in the streets and march for climate change are also going to go to a women's march. I mean, you'd like to think that they care about the same issues, but it's not obvious. And it's amazing because as we've continued, we've now collected data at the March for Racial Justice, as well as the Women's March 10 days ago. And we continue to see this repeat participation across multiple foci. 
And what that means is either one, people just care a lot and they're morally outraged, or two, or maybe and or two, um, people are uh, starting to be engaged in a bunch of different things and they come out, it doesn't matter what the march is about, right? I march for immigration and I march whenever there's a march, it doesn't matter for me. So, one of the other questions we ask before we find out what they actually marched for most recently is, um, what did the people previously protest? And here's where I think things start to get really interesting when we compare, because so far what I basically have shown you is the people who came out to People's Climate March in 2014 and 2017 are relatively similar. There are not that many differences, except for that they saw a lot of really pretty posters in New York, and, and they used their phones more, right? But here's where it gets interesting. So if you look at these previous protests, so what we ask again here is for anybody who's not new, who has participated in a protest before, the question is, what issue have you, what, 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 on what issue, it goes like this, on what issue have you previously protested? And we give a list of categories. And so in 2014, okay, environment, right, it's bringing in the most people, peace, um, and then we've got racial justice, you know, labor, and then immigration. But look in 2017, okay, so the number of people who have previously protested the environment has gone up. But more importantly, I think, is a fifth of the people, almost actually 25%, so almost a quarter of the people, have also participated in protests around racial justice, and 22% around immigration. And this is fascinating for two reasons. One, because this is not the normal coalitions that you see in, with the environmental movement, number one. Um, number two is that it also is that the resistance, a lot of the literature says, the growing literature, says that the resistance started out and has its roots in the immigration rights movement and the Black Lives Matter movement. And so the idea that these people have histories protesting these issues suggests that they actually have some roots in these previous movements as well. They're not just environmental people. And that's very interesting. And it looks, you know, it looks like the Pe People's Climate March in 2017 is all of a sudden drawing from a broader movement. Or, you know, or if you want, and the alternative is drawing from multiple movements. But I like to think of it as drawing from broader movements. So now I can bring you my diversity data. All right, so I have, um, there's been a lot of talk about how the resistance is white and how the Women's March was white, et cetera, and so forth. And it is true that both the Women's March and the People's Climate March were 77% white. All right? However, I think that it's really important to think about the way that the resistance is playing into um, the educated population. Because as I mentioned before, it was an extremely educated group of people. And if you look at people in the United States who hold undergraduate degrees, guess what percentage of them are white? 77% you say? No, it's actually 76%. <laughs> So, you know, basically, in a lot of ways, you see variation here, but in a lot of ways, the diversity is not that far off from the educated population. And so my argument is that I feel like that so far the resistance is drawing, and this runs the gamut, except for the March for Racial Justice, consistency. Um, but what I think is going on is the resistance is drawing from the educated population. And I don't think that it's drawing particularly from, you know, people who are white predominantly, but rather that when you're dealing with educated people. But the resistance, obviously, and that is not to say that, that that can stay that way, because to have a viable movement that is considering a lot of the main issues that are of importance, it has to draw from a broader swath of American society that includes people who are less educated. And that would by itself also increase the diversity. Um, it's interesting, I think, that like, there was this large proportion of Native Americans. I know that you don't think that 2% is a large proportion, but in terms of looking at data from a uh, protest, 2% was a lot. But it's interesting also that we, uh, I had one student who happened to be in the crowd of Native Americans, and they were just not excited about taking service. So worth noting. Um, OK, so now we can talk about motivations. OK, so first thing to note here is that the motivation, the primary, the most most popular motivation, again, this is a check all that apply, at each of these marches is exactly what you would expect. 61% of the people at the Women's March said they came out for women's rights. 97% of the people at the People's Climate March came out for the environment. All right? So yeah, so OK, that's exactly what you would expect. However, 
what I think is really interesting is, okay, let's start with the Women's March. I mean, the Women's March drew from all these movements, all these issues, environment, racial justice, LGBTQ, reproductive rights, all third. So a third of the people in the crowd cared about those issues enough to mention them. And then we go to the People's Climate March, and you see how these numbers are going up as well. I'm now walking back over here again. But like a third mentioned racial justice, a half, over half, at this point, April, are like, I'm here because of Donald Trump, um, because I have to mention that. Uh, almost half for equality. Uh, peace shows up here, and this is when we're you know, talking about the little man and how we may decide to go into a nuclear war. So not a surprise that these issues are coming up, but that these are things that people are answering when you're asked, why are you here? What motivated you to come here? These are the things that they're answering. So what we did here is we started to look at trying to predict how you can predict, try to see how you can predict the motivations. And this is a horrible table. I apologize. Um, but let me tell you what's in this table, and then I'm going to show you a network diagram that's easier to read. And Scott is nodding. That's good. OK, so basically what we have here is these, OK, across the top, what you have are the different motivations. And then we ran logic regression models controlling for gender, age, race, and previous protest engagement as controls to then see which motivations were statistically significantly likely to predict the other motivation. So the idea here is we're looking for cliques of coalitions of motivations to see if there are similarities across what people come out for. So now that I showed you that, I'm going to show you the diagram that I like better to read. BAMO. OK, so this is a network diagram that shows you the same thing, but I think it's easier to look at. The one thing I, I should have mentioned before is that environment is not on the list as a dependent variable, because when you have 97% of the people checking it off, there's no variation. Ergo, you cannot actually run models. So just note that. Environment is on this diagram because not the, envir the environment was statistically significantly less likely to be a motivation for people who checked off women's rights, <clears throat> which I think is very interesting. Um, so it tell, I mean, so and one of the things that I think that suggests is that people were coming out repeatedly, partially because they care and they need to do something. But at the same time, what I think is also interesting is when we see these coalitions forming here around equality and around reproductive rights is what that's supposed to say, and around racial justice and LGBTQ issues. And one of the things that the intersectionality literature would suggest, especially the stuff around intersectional motivations, okay, is that you would see that like, LGBTQ issues would be connected with women's issues to the degree that you feel like reproductive rights is a women's issue, which I think most of the women in the room at least would agree with me on that one. Um, or, for example, Racial justice is linked with social welfare. These are all the people who are worried about the, uh, the ACA and Obamacare, right? Or racial justice being linked with police brutality, you'd expect. Religion, many people here are concerned about a Muslim ban. So we see these overlapping of motivations, which suggests that there are coalitions that are forming around the things that people are interested in. Here's the sad news is that while these, and this is a paper that we actually just finished um, two days ago, <clears throat> while these are really interesting, one of the challenges here is that when we map out these network connections across motivations, across all the protests, not one of those ties is consistent across all the protests. Not one. Like, you couldn't give us just one be immigration in something, but no, not one is statistically significant across them. So to the degree that this is great when you start to think about this <clears throat> and intersectionality in terms of motivations, thinking about coalitions that could be around to challenge the Trump agenda, <clears throat> not so durable. So OK, this is a very wordy slide. I apologize. <clears throat> Hold on one second. So here are my conclusions. Social networks continue to matter for mobilization, and particularly personal networks. 
Participants in the more recent march had been involved in non-environmental protests, and many had protest experience around other social issues, particularly other social issues that we found to be particularly connected with the resistance. The presence of more experienced protesters who are engaged in other issues means that climate concerns are appearing in a range of other movements. And actually, we see this when we look at the other protest events and the people who came out and the degree to which environment continues to be an important issue for them. So the climate movement is connected to the resistance through both more and less identity-based motivations. Um, and I think that the environmental issues have emerged for obvious reasons, those of you who can bear to read the news, uh, as something that people are very concerned about within the Trump era. And as a result, it is something that's motivating people to march when there are opportunities to march. So these data provide a lot of evidence for intersectional motivations. But I did give you, it's not actually in this paper, but it's in this new paper. The potentially depressing part of that is that um, while there are these intersectional motivations, the durability of them is brought into question. And I think that one way of thinking about it is that people, when they march, and you ask them while they're marching, why they're marching, are probably thinking a lot about recent events. And we have just been inundated with things to be concerned about in you know, the past 12 months. And as a result, I guess 13 months now? Um, as a result, I think that when people are checking the boxes, they're checking whatever is at the top of their mind at the time. Um, and we're hoping to start to think about maybe doing some time series around that. The one thing I will say in closing is that uh, I was with a team at the Women's March in Washington, DC, not last week, and the weekend before. And one of the things that was most interesting as I was walking through the crowd surveying is that so many people check just about every box of motivation. I mean, and actually, if you look at the frequencies, there were something like four or five out of 14 that were over 50%. And it ran across the gamut, not just women's rights, not just reproductive rights. Although it was right the day after the, the Right to Life march, so people were thinking about abortion, certainly. Anyway, if you're interested in these kinds of questions, here is a list of some of the papers that I've written around these issues. Um, and also, the book in progress is up at AmericanResistanceBook.com, where I'm publishing chapters as they're done. Uh, so they're the drafts prior to the midterm elections. So at this point, the introduction is up, as well as the chapter on resistance in the streets, which aggregates all the data uh, from protest events. Thank you very much. We have plenty of time for questions. so. And I'll let you handle your own. All right, so you first. Thank you. That was very interesting. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a social scientist, so this is an outsider's question. But when I see your survey results, I guess the question that was nagging at me the whole time was, if you were to take a random sample of left-leaning, educated Americans and ask them what they were thinking about and concerned at any one point in time, say 2014 or 2017, would the people you surveyed at these marches be any different than that random sample? And I guess what I was trying to figure out is, are you really studying the motivation for people to participate in the march? Or are you simply studying, not that this would be a bad thing to study either, but are you actually characterizing what Americans that are left-leaning are concerned about at a particular moment in time. And how do you disentangle that? Is there another data set available that allows you to test against that sort of null hypothesis that you're sampling what society's concerned about and not motivations for protests? How, how do you think about that question? I don't know if I'm articulating it. I hear, I hear what you're saying. I think it makes sense. I mean, here's the deal is that, so, I do not know of a data set that exists that actually is a random sample of Americans and what they're most concerned about right now and that may exist. I could ask, I have some friends at Pew, but what, I mean, I think the point here is that since the resistance is predominantly drawing from the left in America, one would expect that the concerns that they have to be consistent. However, my research question is about those people who choose to engage civically by marching in the streets to understand who they are and why they do that. And the deal is that while you may have the exact same concerns at these levels 
as the people in the street. If you're not marching, you're outside of the scope of the research. And while it may be the same, the one thing I'll tell you that's kind of interesting is that as I've been collecting data, I mean, I, and this is just part of what we have, um, one of the questions is, uh, if you could put yourself on a spectrum from right to left, a seven point scale, where would you put yourself? And increasingly, we have growing percentages of people who would be either moderate, so right in the middle, or that's your right, right, right leaning. I did it right. I was like, no, not left, right leaning. So we had at the Women's March, 15% of the people were either moderates or right leaning individuals, which means that the attitudes in the crowd are then running more across the progressive to conservative spectrum to some degree, but it's only 15%. But I think what it's telling me, I mean, my question is really about who's out there. If it only ends up being the far left, your far left, that is, uh, then you're basically, you know, you're probably gonna have a very hard time making social change in America unless most of the people in America end up being there, right? So you need to have this. And particularly as we move towards, I mean, the next part of my book is specifically looking at what I'm calling resistance in the districts, which is all the ways that people are engaging in politics beyond marching within their communities and in their states and specifically in the congressional districts. And what I'm finding is that the people who are marching are increasingly doing other civic, civic forms of participation and they're doing it in their communities. And so if that helps us tell, you know, this helps us find out what else they're doing, I think that's particularly important. But I think that you know, in terms of thinking about social movements, which was the object of inquiry for this paper, by understanding what motivates people to do something that's you know, somewhat heavy lift of marching, it's not high risk activism, but it's more than just writing a check for certain, you know, this helps us understand who they are and how they're connected to one another. Go ahead. Um, first of all, a great talk. I just to piggyback off of what you're just saying, one of my questions um, did have to do if, if you really question people on other forms of civic engagement uh -huh. and not just local protests, but I, I'm always really interested in those who show up for a march. Do they go back home and run for office? Do they show up to city council meetings? Do they testify at public hearings? Um, so did you ask any questions that, that related more to other forms of civic engagement? We asked 12 questions. Uh, tw 12? So we basically took uh, civic engagement questions from the general social survey and the Roper study. Um, and then uh, my students added a couple wearing safety pins, one of them. Uh, I added a direct action question. So we have data, I think it's 12. On that, I have a different presentation where I actually talk about how civic engagement levels have changed. Because you're completely right. I mean, one of the things that I feel like I've been asked so many times since last January is, why are they marching? Marching doesn't do anything, you know? And the deal is that you're right. If that is your only tactic in your toolbox, you're not going to make much social change. Because it's not like one day Donald Trump's going to be like, you're right. You guys marched again. I'm coming out. Take the White House. I think it's a dump anyway, or whatever he said, right? But um, that's not going to happen. But at the same time, as we know from research over the years into social movements, Protesting is just one of the tools in the toolbox, one of the tactics. And the other ones are all these different types of democratic participation, which is why I think it's so important to ask that. And those numbers, so at the Women's March last January, those numbers were already statistically significantly higher than the general public. And we asked, you know, spoken to an elected official, run for office, contacted the media to express your opinions. This is all in the last year. Gone to a town hall meeting. And up until this past Women's March, Going to a town hall meeting went up every time. And then I was like, ah, oh, it went down at the Women's March. What does this mean? And then I met with a guy who just started a group called the Town Hall Project, which is a really cool group. You guys should check it out, which basically monitors all the times that elected officials are having town halls in districts. And he's like, many elected officials are refusing to hold town halls now. So that the opportunity cost is going down. So therefore, people aren't doing it. But I think that's really key. And I think you're right. Like, if this is all that we see, the resistance is weak, but it's not. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I thought Dove's question was a good one. Um, I was living in DC last winter and spring, so I was one of the like, people who, you know, there was a march every weekend and I would go out and join, and I felt like my reasoning wasn't necessarily because I cared about uh, the March for Science more than I cared about the immigration march. I just went out, and I'm wondering if so certainly for a certain demographic, it mm -hmm. seemed like uh, you went out to the marches because it was a thing to do on the weekend. 
No. Um, and I'm wondering if you collected data about where people came from, because I kind of imagine that people who are coming from farther away would probably care more specifically about that issue, and if that had any impact on the data about uh, what people's motivations were. That's a great idea. So this project is a moving target because, you know, when we do social science well, things are happening sometimes, you know. So I have data on where you traveled, but the, one, the first question is where did you come from today to get mm -hmm. here? And we asked for zip codes, and if it was out of the United States, we asked you to tell you what country. Um, I have that data. Historically, I've used it to map, and we've done some GIS stuff with it, and I haven't gone to that part of the data yet, because that's a very important question. I completely agree that it's very likely that people who are coming out every weekend are locals. The other thing, though, I found in previous research, so not this stuff that has been since the People's Climate March in 2014, was that whenever you have a very large-scale protest event, so over 100,000 people or so, you have to draw from more than just uh, the local area, but the locals are what, like, they're like, they're the bread and butter, you know? If you don't have the locals out and you just have buses coming in, you need a lot of buses. You know, I mean, and one of the things I was shocked about with the Women's March in 2018, which I actually think in some ways your question would be really good to think about and interrogate with the Women's March in 2018. So one of the things about the Women's March 2018 that was fascinating is, you know, there's this group called the Women's March. It's actually a national professional organization. You probably have seen, you know, some of the spokespeople. They were in vogue at one point, so you may have seen them there. They called, instead of they decided not to march, they basically called to have an event in Nevada. They were going to, it's powered the polls, and they wanted to start talking about that. They went to Nevada, and they invited people to join them in Nevada, which is quite far away, because it's a swing state. And they went, and they had a meeting in like a big um, like a stadium. So the thing that's really interesting is all of these local groups said, you know what, we want to march. And so they decided to organize marches. And one of the things I think is really interesting is that when we went out, I was like, I don't think anybody's going to come there were only four buses that came to Washington, D.C. 10 days ago. Whereas at the Women's March a year before, as hundreds of buses came to Washington, D.C. They had like a whole, they had like rules about where the buses were allowed to go. Four buses, so I was like, it's gonna be small, but we should go and collect data anyway, because it's, you know, because we're here. And uh, it was like 100,000 people there, but they were all local. So it would be very interesting, like maybe we could do something with those locational data to see how it's different and how organizationally tied they are. But it was really fascinating. I mean, and it's, it's important to ask those questions. I completely agree with you. But um, I have not looked at that with the data yet. Sorry. How do your demographics compare to the Earth Day events in 1970? Can you, you know, there's a narrative about Earth Day that it was more inclusive, had labor, had a sort of broader cross section, maybe not quite as top heavy as, as this one is. This is sort of an upper class event. Is it, do you have any sense of how the climate movement compares to the original Earth Day movement? It's funny that you said that because my understanding is that people kind of felt like Earth Day and the environmental movement started out as an extremely white privileged movement. And the research, a lot of that research is like, I don't know anybody who collected any demographic data. So this is all yeah, based on anecdotal experiences. And the interesting thing is the climate movement has tried very hard to diversify and bring in people from frontline communities since 2014. Whereas, you know, many, like Sierra Club's policy is they don't want to talk about anything without talking about race and class. So I actually would guess, and I don't have data, so I can't say, but I would guess that we see actually more diversity now than we did before. I think the argument is labor was very much part of that early period where you could argue labor is not what it was. I mean, there's data just today on why income inequality continues and the decline of labor in America. So maybe it, you know, some core things have changed about the demographics of America anyways since that time. Definitely. I mean, and the thing is, like, with regard to labor, I, since I've been collecting data since 2000, I have data from the globalization movement versus environmental protests since 2000, because the globalization movement was really active then, so I was collecting data on that as well. The globalization movement certainly had more people who said they previously protested around labor issues prior to coming to whatever the World Bank protests and other places where I collected data, or the World Economic Forum protests where I collected data, versus previous environmental protests. However, wait, where is it? What did they previously protest? Okay, so labor, 10% is not great. So 
So labor, yeah, I mean, Could there's not a lot of connection here. I mean, I have a... Well, she had an anti-war movement going there, too. Let's see if you should... Well, no, when I... Oh yeah, 1970, but when I collected data before, which I actually know, I, I have data on, there was before the anti-war movement resumed in the United States. So there, it was just the globalization movement resonated more with people from labor than the environmental movement seems to be so far today. Yeah? Could you include income? I wonder if that would correlate to the 44% of uh, postgraduate or college education? So um, my sense is that a lot of people in the crowd will not answer an income question. We ask sector, so where, what sector are they employed, mm -hmm. um, as a proxy along with educational attainment. But I'm guessing we would get a lot of empty answers there. I mean, as it is, it's interesting because at the Women's March, we, um, so the first Women's March, uh, there were all these rumors that Bikers for Trump and a lot of other people were going to be coming in the crowd and threatening people in the crowd. And so the organizer actually sent out, which like broke my heart, two days before they posted on Facebook and sent out a bunch of messages to people who had signed up saying, don't fill out anything at the Women's March. Don't give any of your information away. And so we have an anonymous survey, but I was like, people are all going to say no. They're gonna, we're going to get a high refusal rate. But we didn't, actually. In fact, people were super, super nice. Um, but people do seem to, like, when you get to somewhat personal questions, and we did actually add a sexual orientation question, which we hadn't had before. Um, and people, you know, give you this, like, OK, I'll check that off. But I don't, I don't know. I don't think we get good data. I mean, it's an interesting idea. We could try, I mean, there are lots of things that I was like, oh, we could do this interesting methodological test here and ask it this way versus this way and compare the data. But we just haven't done that. Yeah? Do you have data from like Black Lives Matter protests that, that looks at whether or not people are coming out for the environment in those? So No. Okay. No, I mean, that would be great. So uh, I didn't collect data at Black Lives Matter because I was doing this project on climate politics. And because I usually go out in the crowd when there's over 50,000 people in the streets, which is very, we didn't have much of that around Black Lives Matter. Um, and nobody was asking motivations questions. So even if people were like, people are marching about black lives. We should march about environment, too. I'm going to go out there and join forces. Uh, I, we wouldn't know. I mean, and we should know. But you know, when we do research, it, you know, we learn as we go. So I wish I knew, though. Uh, thanks for the presentation. It was super interesting. I'm also thinking about the income question in that I think it's a pretty fair assumption that those who are able to mobilize themselves and their families to D.C. or New York for these centralized marches are likely to have the means to take off two days for work to provide the transportation to get there. And I'm wondering how different you think this data would look if you were looking at local marches. Uh, so people who can take an hour off of work instead of the whole day, and whether or not that would be correlated to the, dem the demographics you came up with, but also education levels. So the answer, so the, qu the first answer is I, I would just say, you know, so, um, so I always collect data at weekend marches, which are the big marches. You can't get a big march on a weekday because people have to work. Even rich people have to work. <laughs> Most of them at least. <laughs> um, so, and, and the other thing I find is his, across the board, the large scale marches always have a lot of locals, right? Versus people who are spending a lot of money. Um, I mean, the other thing is that the march in DC last weekend was entirely local. But I mean, I, the other thing I would just highlight here is that, so the Women's March had an amazing list of sister marches around the country. And the People's Climate March did too, right? So people who couldn't go to DC marched elsewhere. I didn't collect data on them um, because I'm in DC, so I collect data in DC. Um, but a question like it would be interesting to see if the marches, like for example, this most recent women's march, which was purely organized by Virginia and people in Virginia, will we see a difference in educational attainment? And if I recall correctly, the education levels are almost identical to last year. But it also is like Washington DC has the highest number of lawyers in the country, <laughs> something to be very proud of. Um, so if you're just sampling from local populations, you're going to get a highly educated group. And that would be different. I mean, Michael Heaney, a colleague of mine at University of Michigan who does amazing work, he collects data on smaller scale protests. 
and he's collected data at all these different protests, including protests in Detroit, he would be able to answer that question better than me. So, I mean, it's, it's not that it's not an important question, it's just I don't have the capacity really to answer with the data I have. Scott, you had a question. Yeah, let's, I wanted to try to um, think more carefully about the relationship between these motivational clusters that you're showing us in your network slide and uh, actual coalitions. Huh? And it strikes me from the data that you know, one of the ways to think about that I'm thinking about this is that people are coming out um, through they're they're triggered by social media is organizing this or is the is the sort of informational uh, uh, you know, information is flowing through social media not organizations and it's through and people are coming um, they are coming out collectively as families and friendship networks not organizations mm -hmm. so how does how does motivational clusters how do these motivational clusters translate into organized coalitions? And I, I mean, what I'm thinking is that you didn't get, in your other study, you didn't find statistically significant differences across your uh, cases um, because they haven't formed yet. But the potential for forming is real and mm -hmm. strong. But this is just happening. And it's not, you know, I think we talked this about this a little bit in our class the other day. These, these people are here not because they've been organized to get out, but they've been, they're here because it's current, and they've got social media, and they've got friends and family who are doing it, so they're doing and it And they too. care. I think they, they care. care. Most of them care. Right, but they're not organized mm -hmm. the way they would have been seven, you know, in, in, in the 1970s, Europe. for yeah. sure. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you think about that? That there's that the, the organizing, where this doesn't represent, this is not the result of organization and coalitions. It's, it's the foundations from onto which coalitions are now primed to form. Yeah. I mean, I think you said this to me yourself, Scott, but like, if you think back to uh, previous, uh, previous periods of high levels of convention in the United States, civil rights movement, environmental movement, um, women's rights movement, you know, anti-war movement around Vietnam, in all of those periods, the way you got people out was you used organizations. You could use social ties, personal ties, some, but you had to have organizations. And organizations had to call the marches, and they brought labor there, right? It used to be that labor would always come. I mean, I collected data, thanks in part to some of Timmins' grad students at the Copenhagen Climate March in 2012. Undergrads. Oh, undergrads. Sorry, sorry. Undergrads. Yay, brown undergrads. Um, <laughs> 2012 though, right? In Copenhagen at climate negotiations. And they were, hmm? 2009, 12. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't collect data at all there. No, I, so I, so I, okay. I can't remember very much, but I was there and my toes, it took over three days for me to get feeling back because we were surveying in the dark in Copenhagen. But here was the point, was that we actually surveyed a whole bunch of people who were brought through labor and they all came in their labor shirts. Um, and it was really interesting to see labor in the crowd because we don't see it so much in the United States. But um, I think that today you go to most of these marches and the ways that people define organizational ties might be move on. I mean, I don't know how many people here keep getting the emails from move on, but it's, that's not like organization. That's like organization, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's not the same kind of a durable tie. And, I mean, Scott, going back to your question, I think that this shows the ways that coalitions could form across organizations. Organizations now, I mean, there are a lot of bad things going on in our country, but organizations have the capacity to raise money like they haven't in years. ACLU is so flush. Um, they just started a whole people program specifically around grassroots organizing in districts because of it. And the deal is that this is the kind of thing they could do where they start to work in these coalitions. So in a lot of ways, you're right, this is like, this is the seed for a movement that has organizational connections. Yeah, this but isn't the consequence of organization, it's the conditions for organization. For a potential successful organization, yeah. So maybe since this is up, uh, I'll ask a question about this. I see a few things in here that seem very counterintuitive to me, and I'm wondering how much of it is a result of the way you're analyzing the data as opposed to the actual, like, that you've actually revealed the true structure of the data. So, okay. For example, if I'm reading this correctly, people who care about brutality are not positively correlated with caring about social welfare. 
Is that right? The absence of the arrow between those two things is... So let me, let me just explain. So these are actually a logit regression models. So it's yeah. not correlation, it's actually regression. And so any arrow pointing to it, where it's police brutality, okay, so reproductive <laughs> rights is statistically significantly more likely to predict uh, social welfare is not. Right. Yes. Okay. So I guess given that you have all of these, you have 400 or so people who are checking like most of the boxes. No, not at the People's Climate March. Okay. So the average I think is five. Boxes. Okay, okay. So is there any, I'm just wondering about how, pow how powerful this test is to detect all of the possible interactions. Like, so for example, you have reproduction connected to social welfare connected to politics, but you don't have reproduction connected to politics. Well, but that is, so the indirect connections are not, is I don't think that you can assume transitivity there, which just sounds like what you're doing. Well, no, what I'm asking is, what I'm saying, I'm not assuming it, I'm just sort of asking about your power to detect. Like, so you can't, like, I'm, I'm just. But in all of the models, all of the different motivations were in there, and then I'm just showing you the ones where statistically significantly common across them. I mean, one of the things that we have in our new paper is we did some cluster modeling so that we actually are able to see the clusters among these. And I do not have it on my slide, but there's some interesting stuff to see how, so we're able to look at the similarities of the clusters, but also we're able to see the patterns of which are more and less similar across the individuals who check them. But I, it's actually quite robust, these findings. So I don't think it's about the way we asked it. I think it may be about the way people are thinking about it, right? So yeah, people who care about police brutality, they should care about social welfare, sure. But they didn't check the box to make it statistically simple. When you control for these other variables. Yeah. Hi. One thing that popped into my head when you showed this and explained it and then talked about durability of these uh, organizing ideas was the media surrounding the idea that the Democratic Party doesn't have a message, um, right? And so there's been you know discussion of you know for example like in the previous administration the Republicans' message was whatever Obama says it's no, <laughs> right? And that was an organizing principle that they utilized effectively. Right. And, but there seems to be a lot of media surrounding like the Democrats just don't have a message and you know there's lots of different messages out there and I guess what, what I, when I looked at this it reflected like well maybe it's because they can't have a message <laughs> because nobody would get around a message well, and, I, and so I'm just curious about your thoughts on that I mean it's just a random you know it's not, not specifically to your research right? just, you know it's a, it's a good question I mean and actually it ties into this number right here which keeps going up how many people are just coming out because of Trump just kind of kept checking that box, right? And if you want to use Trump as an organizing <laughs> principle, uh, these data suggest you should. Uh, I mean, I so I have written uh, critiques of the Democratic Party since my second book in 2006, and the book that I'm writing now is actually very much a critique of the Democratic Party and the way that they actually engage in grassroots politics. So I would argue that the fact that these people are organizing despite the Democratic Party not because the Democratic Party actually is giving them any messages to get them out to do anything. And the fact that there are so many of these organizations, most of which have these histories of springing up the day after the election or by the time of the inauguration to do something in districts because this can never happen again, is proof that the Democratic Party is like missing it. And then the fact that they come out last summer and decide to raise money off of resistance summer, you know, so I mean like, I think you're right, like they're not messaging well. And I think there's a lot of stuff in here, particularly when you start seeing the patterns of, that they could message around. So, yeah? Just a quick question. I don't remember if you touched on this before, but just the discrepancy on the Trump line between those two marches, because I would, would have thought the Women's March was a lot to do with Trump. Yeah, I mean, I think that the deal is that, well, a lot of people may have marched partially because of, the, I mean, I think that it's also people were like, I don't like what Trump said and all of, you know, the ways that he treats women. So I'm here for women's rights. I'm not here for Trump. So they spun it that way. But you're right. I mean, there's overlap thing this year. But those are the people who specifically said Trump. But we have to think in some ways that <laughs> Donald Trump does drive much of this. Yeah, it's just a surprising difference. Yeah, I mean, and I, it, it, it gets even higher, so it gets, you know, we see it more and more. Yeah? Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I find the idea of creating those categories of motivations especially interesting. And I was just wondering, 
when you were going out and getting people to take the surveys, you said surprisingly a lot of people would check most of the spots. I said at the the most recent women's march. At the women's march. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was just wondering. I feel like there is also kind of this pressure when you go to marches like that to kind of be able to like show and prove to yourself as well that you're morally conscious and to like fill out most of those or to check most of those motivations. And I was wondering if you had a box that um, that people could fill in on their own. That's yeah, as an other where where you can do a writing. Yeah, we have that. I mean, the deal is that while people may feel this, what we would call on stage effect, what we ended up with all is, you know, I guess people don't, maybe, maybe would choose they didn't want to leave it completely blank. However, I mean, at the Women's March in 2017, the average was 2.7 motivations were checked off per respondent, right? And the, one of the points of data here is that we're now up to it being like seven per respondent or something like that. I haven't run those statistics exactly. Do you think it would be useful to have people rank kind of like what they especially care more about? Or do you, have you ever asked questions of like a certain motivation that they feel is especially lacking in that march? So we haven't asked those things. I mean, here's the deal is that when we go to marches, there are people who are there not to take our survey. And uh, so the survey takes about 10 minutes. Um, and asking a complex thing about ranking while somebody is trying to make sure their child doesn't run away or their friends don't ditch them and go into the crowd and they can never find them again. Like, we got to be careful about how the survey is designed. I mean, it would be interesting to ask these ranking questions, what issue is most important to you? I think, though, by just looking at the percentages here, we see that at, you know, women's rights was most important at the Women's March 2017. The environment was most important at the People's Climate March 2017. I can tell you racial justice was most important at the March for Racial Justice 2017. Environment was most important at the March for Science. And I think that we don't have to ask them to find that out. So it's, it's, it's what you might expect. Um, but I mean, it would be interesting. I just think that it, it's, the methodology does not make it possible to ask an endless number of questions. And I think it's more important, particularly given the research questions that I ask, to ask those civic engagement questions, because I think they're really important. Yeah? Daniel. So, um one way you could, you could try putting it into one where you can only discuss like three or something. Because the first one is less interesting in some ways. Yeah. But that would be a way to sort of get at, can you pick out rankings that are actually making you take the time to rank? Thought. That's cool. I can just see all the protesters yelling at me being like, how am I supposed to pick three? <laughs> uh, the second thought, um, in terms of getting at sort of mass media type effects of sort of what's salient that week, um, other sorts of data that might be useful are things like Google Trends data, mm -hmm. or just looking at front pages of major newspapers in the day before the march, for all topics that weren't about that. You can imagine seeing if there was a particular spike in some topic that is driving some of these results. But I, don't, I would guess not because it's kind of across the board, but if you wanted to rule it out, you'd kind of need to be ready to do that. That's a good idea. No, that's a great idea. So, I mean, as, uh, well, as if, to the degree that protest dies down and I can just sit and marinate on the data, <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great way to do it. I would love to be able to t try to um, see if we can start to um, think in a more critical way about what these patterns mean, because I think it's really important. So hopefully there'll be time to do that. And that, that would be great. Google Trends. I like that. Or, or the front page. Google Trends probably is where most people are getting their information. So it might be better to go there. I found it kind of like a psychoanalysis of myself. <laughs> so that Did you learn something about yourself? <laughs> so basically, I would be one of the people who checked all of these. And the reason for that is that I don't actually think a lot of them are sort of separate issues. And the way I think of it is that we, we're all getting screwed over by the same people. And most of them are, are rich white people, are capitalist business people, and so on. Um, so, I mean, so for me, the sort of division into categories is kind of a weird thing. I'm just wondering how you might approach it. Like another way to approach this would be, who is our enemy? <laughs> As opposed to which category are, are, do you feel most strongly about? Because I feel like the intersectionality that's being created is that people are figuring out that actually it's the same people who are involved in a lot of these, who are you know, you know, creating a lot of these problems. So to the degree that people continue to protest to check all of them, I think they're all becoming enlightened as you. So, but at the same time, I think if I were to ask a lot of the people in the crowd, and I'm thinking particularly of like the grandmothers who had to like bring their own little 
the, the like you know the cane chairs and they were sitting on the cane chairs and I said to them if I had a question like who is your enemy I just I'm not sure how that's gonna play in the crowd so well I mean the biker guys with the really long there was a whole group of guys at the women's march last weekend who had these really long white beards and they were like long white beard biker guys that's what they told me their name was and they would be cool with them and enemy questions so I mean but I see what you're saying I mean one of the other things that I, I I've always done is we collect contact information for anybody who's willing to participate in follow-up interview. So it seems like something that one could be interrogate really nicely that way, perhaps, rather than a survey in a crowd of strangers. Because at least we have this sense of like closeness more when you're doing like an interview, maybe. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering. So you said you um, sampled uh, adults. So I was wondering how like it would affect um, the data. Like you took like age demographics, like included high school students, because I know about high school students. There's a lot of activism going on in high schools. You're right. So okay, first I would probably lose my job. So because we require, I would have to get a parental signature to be allowed to actually ask the age of any minors in the crowd. Um, IRB, thank you very much. Uh, but I mean, so I can tell you things about um, kind of observations. One of the things I, I've learned is that I'm very bad at identifying people's age. And there was an extremely facial haired boy at the Women's March who was like 15. <laughs> and he filled out the survey. And I was like, OK, thank you. Rip, 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 rip. Sorry, I didn't do that. But I mean, so the deal is like, I think that. I mean, if the question is, what is motivating people who are under the age of 18, I don't know the answer. And we would have to, based on the way that research is done in this country and regulated in this country, we would actually have to do something where we got parental consent and then went out and specifically talked to high school kids. Now, I have done some stuff in DC public schools that's completely a different project around school gardens. And we did, but to get parental consent in the DC public schools. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was a class of 20-some kids, and three kids brought back the consent form. So, you know, therein lies the problem. But I think you're right that they, it, young people seem to be very engaged, and I think it's wonderful. Um, so there might be other ways to get at that data, but surveying in the crowd, if you're regulated by an IRB, is not a good one, because you can't. Yeah? I feel done. <laughs> You've been fielding questions for 40 minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.